I'm Neil Wingfield, and this is Cameron Garrow. And Professor Dagon asked us to uh, look at a woman in mathematics because uh, he felt it was important uh, to highlight women in mathematics because throughout history we see this trend for women to be to for women to be kind of de-emphasized in mathematics. So, um, I mean, what, why do why do people not take women so seriously in mathematics? Well, it's part. It has to do with the with the social structure. Right nowadays, things are a lot different. You know what I'm saying? And we have you know things have improved a lot mm -hmm. for for women. But back in the day, it was really like uh, a, a boys' club. And socially, the way it was structured was men were in the power role, and pretty much they had all the power positions and they were in control. So when it came to mathematics. Even though there was women that were successful mathematicians and were very brilliant, they were not really highlighted because men had all the men pretty much had all the all the control. So the person we're going to look at today is Lenore Bloom, and she had a significant impact not only in mathematics but also advocating for women to be able to get involved in mathematics and the sciences and really make a difference. My uh, partner here is going to go ahead and give us a, a, a little bit of a bio about uh, Lenore Bloom. Lenore was born in December, on December 18th, 1942. Um, at a young age, she developed a um, love for art, math, and music. Um, during her elementary years, she attended school in New York, um, then later moved to um, Car Carcass. Venezuela, Caracas, Caracas <laughs> Venezuela. Should have had Neil say that part. But uh, for high school and um, junior years of college or high uh, of high school, um, at 16 she finished college and she attempted her first try to get into MIT. Um, this proved to be a failure, but um, still it, it kind of motivated her to continue her education. Um, so she attended Carnegie Tech, which is in Pittsburgh. Um, and started to study architecture. Um, and then later she discovered what her true love was math. Um, in her third year of college, um, she transferred to Boston to a, a women's college called Simmons. Um, at Simmons, her math courses weren't challenging enough for her, um, so she cross-registered to MIT. And this was her first attempt to um, to get into MIT where she can like get everyone to know what she's about and show that she really can stay with the big guys. Um, and this proved to be successful to her because she got into the college of her dreams. Um, after she graduated from Simmons, um, later in 1968, she received her PhD in mathematics at MIT. This was a big deal in 1968 uh, because not only was Lenore a woman, obviously, but she was also Jewish. So she had to face a lot of um, uh, prejudices and a lot of so she had to break a lot of social norms to to be able to accomplish this. And she persevered through all of her challenges to obtain her PhD in mathematics. And she was very, very good. Um. After her getting her doctor, her, her, she, for two years, she did her postdoctorate studies and um, was a lecturer at UC Berkeley. Um, sh this is really when she began to get her name known in the mathematics scene. Um, she was one of the first members of the Association of Women in Mathematics, um, and she was a very key component to making this organization um, to where it to what impact it made, um, and she also served as the president of that organization. Uh, she, for 13 years, um, she was she was at Mills College, where she, I guess, really, I mean, founded their math and computer science department. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, she turned away from teaching and lecturing and fo started focusing more on her research, and this really helped her and her family prosper. Um, and gain recognition in the mathematics world. The next clip is going to be a video of, of Lenore Bloom talking about uh, the Women's Association and how important it is to get women engaged in mathematics and giving them equal access to, um, 
to the same opportunities that men have. In this minute, it's about three and a half minutes. Yeah. This clip. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and um, yeah, so I've been around for a long time. I don't know how, if that's good news or bad news, but I'm still here. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work at Carnegie Mellon, but uh, what I found is over the years, women who, and scientists who get involved in this, we, re we wear 10 million hats, right? He told you about one of them. So before, uh, women students being the minority do not have access and did not have access and were often excluded from these implicit important advantages. And as one goes through the professional world, similar phenomena occur. In fact, um, I don't know if you heard about this uh, controversy in the U.S. about a year ago, the president of Harvard was sort of saying, it was, very, it was a great thing because for the first time in the 35 years I've worked in this area, Every single day in the New York Times was an article on women's science. And this went on for a long time until they kicked him out or he, he was fired and he left. So that was too bad now. But um, I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal once, you know, so they call up people about this, and I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal. And let me tell you how the quote went. It said, when Lenore Blum, this is one of my other hats, was deputy director of Mass Science Research Institute at Berkeley, she noticed that on Mondays, uh, there would be all these great theorems that people would present by the guys there. And she realized that over the weekend, Berkeley's a really nice area, there's a bay out there, people go sailing, the weather's great. The guys would come and then they would rent a boat together and go sailing together. And, uh, you know, having fun on the bay and they're also proving theorems. Now, if you were one of the very few women there in mathematics up there and your senior a colleague was there and you'd like to work with them, it would be very difficult to say, hey, let's rent a boat for the weekend, we can go sailing, maybe have some fun, and maybe we'll prove some theorems. So this sort of thing where a lot of, I started noticing that all the, lots of theorems were coming out of these social events where women were excluded. And so it was important to create an environment where we could sort of uh, duplicate that kind of professional social interaction and where you get experience of, with your friends doing computer science doing mathematics. Okay, so that's really one of the major reasons for setting up an organization like Women in SES, and I think it's very similar to having the WIT program. It's not separate from everybody else, but it's, it's providing some of these experiences that are so critical, and that have been implicit. People don't recognize how important, but I think for males in this audience, just imagine if you didn't have those social, professional experiences, what, how your careers would go. Uh, now to some of her accomplishments. In 2009, she was awarded the Catalyst Award um, at the Carnegie Science Center. Um, in 2004, she was given the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Math, Engineering, Mentoring. Um, and this is that picture up on the right-hand side um, with President Bush. She was the f founding co-director of the Math and Science Network Expanding Your Horizon Conferences. Um, which started in 19, 90, or 1975, and also she, which is a, this is a big accomplishment, was she served as Vice President of the um, American Mathematics Society from 1990 to 1993. These are her colleagues, some of her colleagues and some of her role model. Probably her, the, the person that's had the biggest influence in um, Lenore's uh, life has been Manuel Bloom, which is also her husband. Uh, the reason that she moved from Caracas to, to Boston was to be with her now husband, then uh, boyfriend, and he's also a mathematician. They not only did they go to the same school, but they also are in the field of mathematics. So um, they've, these people have worked together to publish books and to come up with theorems. Lenore has focused her studies in computer science. Go ahead to the, to the next slide. And this is one of, uh, one of the big things they did back, I think it was in the 70s. And it's called the Blum Blum Shub, Shub which is a hilarious name. <laughs> one of the reasons we're showing it. Uh, and basically what it is, it's, it's a uh, pseudo random number, uh, number generator that is very secure. And this formula here is basically what the number generator is. 
This is a little bit outdated because nowadays they don't use this. It's a little too slow, but this was a really uh, a big deal. And there's a little bit of an explanation on the PowerPoint there of, of, how, of how it works. All right. And then some of her famous works. Um, <coughs> these are all books and articles that she wrote. Um, this is her thesis um, for her postdoctorate at MIT. Um, and then also some work she did with her husband and um, complexity and real co computation. This was a big, big, big deal. Um, she worked with Philippe Cooker, um, Michael Shubb, and Stephen Small. Um, and this was a discovery they made in 1997, and this, or when they published it. Um, and it was it was really a, a development in computer software design and understanding uh, how how it all works. More than understanding on how it all works, but also they came up with a way that uh, revolutionized actually computer science and, and software development because they were able to solve um, the, the problem of P equals uh, P times N, which uh, has been a big, it's a big thing in, in computer software. Her mathematics that go into this book are very, very deep and way beyond the scope of, of my understanding. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to give, I'm going to give you guys a little presentation on binary conversions and kind of getting an understanding of how computers, uh, software talks, you know, and talks to the computer. So basically we have um, my little cheat sheet is gone. That's, that's good. So, <laughs> where's it at? Oh, kind of need that. <laughs> so, so basically, when you write out um, a number, like we don't think about it that much because you know, it's just, it's just common practice. You know, 144. We don't think about it, but this is actually in base 10, because we have 10 digits in in the system we work on. But computers can't really understand base 10. Computers only work on a digital single that produces ones and zeros. It's either current or no current. So they work off of what's called base 2, which is just ones and zeros. Now, um, basically, when you write a number in base 2 for a computer, you write it in what's called a, a bit. Well, each bit has eight bytes. So this is produced by, the other way did, I, did I mix it up, byte yes. and bit? Each My byte bad. Is eight. Each byte is eight bits, exactly, I'm sorry. So, um, and the way it works is based on, you know, the powers, uh, the base two to the power of zero, one, two, three, and so on to seven. And that would produce our eight bits, right? <laughs> <laughs> so when we're doing, <laughs> when we're doing a conversion, if uh, Aaron would give me a number, just pick any number for between, has to be th between zero and 255. 253. 253, okay, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, so if we get 253, Excuse me. If we get 253, right, and we go ahead and write the uh, the numbers that correspond to the powers of two. So that would be two to the power of seven, two to the power of six, and so on and so forth. Sorry. And basically when you do when you're doing a conversion from a base 10 to a base 2 is we go ahead and say, okay, how many times uh, can 128 go into 253? Aaron? One time. One time? Okay, so we go boop, and then we subtract 128 from that, right? So we have left 1, 3, and... 125. Yeah, I'm sorry. 125, 
So then we go to the next slot. Okay, how many times? Can 64 go into 125? It does, right? So we just 1. And that's the only option you have. You have a 1 and a 0. So, right? So then it's going to be 61. So then does 32 go into uh, to 61? Yes, it does. So we do the subtraction. And we go to the next number, so that's going to be 29. And we say 16 does go into 29, so we put another 1. And that gives us 13. So does 8 go into 13? Yes, so we put another 1. Subtract the 8. Right? Leaves us 5. So does 4 go into 5? Yes. Leaves us 1. Does 2 go into 1? No, it doesn't. So we put a 0. And then 1 goes into 1. So this 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1 is going to be the binary representation of 253. And that's basically your conversion from from base 10 to binary. Right. So today, now in the day, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Blum and uh, the Blums actually, they work all together. The, the manual and their son there. That's Abram. Yeah, Abram that's pictured in the in the middle there. They all work together, and it's just one uh, one big happy family. Yeah, there. <laughs> there's a article on the Post Gazette um, where Abram talks about how he he is happy that his family works with him, um, but he had got the job there first, and then his family came to him, um, which is kind of like he feels like his his, his life is like kind of like a TV sitcom because um, he's always with his parents, and he's just kind of like. I mean, they, they love each other, and they love being and working with each other. It's just, he, uh, he kind of describes how he feels about it, and it's, yeah. it's a pretty it's funny article. It's funny because uh, uh, Abram talks about how his office, is, uh, he, his office was there first, and then they put his mother and his dad to either side, so he's like sandwiched in the middle between, <laughs> between the offices. Yeah. And that's our presentation on uh, Lenore Bloom, and these are her references. Any questions?